Now, as we turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, this is the text that our confession refers to, in which why point 2 is important for us as believers who confess the truth of God's word. 2 Timothy 3, 16 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, I remember many years, uh, a few, many years ago, um, we were in one Bible study, and I had asked the church before I opened up the passage of Scripture to teach that Friday, and I asked the church, turn your Bibles to the book of Hezekiah. And some of the people in the room started flipping their Bibles, looking for the book of Hezekiah, while some gave me a smile because they knew Hezekiah would never be found. So those people flipping their Bibles would be flipping for hours and hours and will never find Hezekiah because Hezekiah is not in their Bible. Well, the message that Friday was to love your Bibles, to meditate on God's Word day and night. And that test was to reveal, not to ex embarrass nor expose those who, uh, well, really it was to expose, uh, but it was to show us internally and personally, do we know our Bibles? But not just know our Bibles, do we love our Bibles? And that's what 1.2 is about. When you read commentaries of uh, the 1689 LBCF on 1.2, it is very short. The major writings of, uh, of men who wrote on uh, the LBCF don't write much of 1.2. Some summarize it as just merely a list, and that may be very true to those who read it. And as I was reading that, some of us may have been thinking, well, I know this. That's just a list. I don't even need to read with pastor what he's uttering because I already know that that's the 66 books of the Bible. Well, the truth is, brethren, we all need to be directed in recognizing God's Word. We all do. There are those who are just starting off, maybe just got saved, maybe have been with the church for many years, but still are babes and need proper direction in recognizing and identifying what the Bible actually means when it says all Scripture. We all know that the Bible is that infallible, uh, certain, and most precise Word of God. We know the benefits that come from the Scriptures, that it is profitable for teaching, reproof, and correction, and training in righteousness for the man of God. But if you were asked as one who wasn't, rec uh, wasn't familiar with God's Word, and you were asked the question, when Paul says all Scripture in verse 16... What does that mean? Someone who doesn't have a Bible in their hands, perhaps may, just, may have just got saved, and uh, is not so familiar with the 66 books of the Bible, and is confronted with the text, all Scripture. What does all Scripture mean? Now, it's easy for you and I to answer that question, because you have a Bible, you bought it at the bookstore, and it has 66 books there. But I'm, I can guarantee you that if you did not have that, guide, that guidance... And if you didn't have that train, uh, that line of faithful men who God had used to preserve His Word, we would really be put to the test in recognizing and discerning which of the writings of antiquity are truly God's Word. Um, and so when Paul says all Scripture, is it all Scripture pertaining to what we think God breathed, what we think God inspired, or is Paul referring to that very intimate work of God that he only spoke and expressed through each writer of each book. And so I, that's why I say to you, we all need to uh, humble ourselves before the Lord. And yes, this is a list, but how deeply are we fam uh, really uh, familiar with these books and are in love with these books? Maybe we're not starting off. Maybe we are considered quote-unquote experts of the Bible. We can memorize and even um, express Genesis to Revelation uh, without even looking at our table of contents. Uh, but perhaps even if we are experts, we fail to appreciate the words of life. If I were to ask you, 
Um, are you familiar with the contents of each book? Why each book was written? To who it was written? And what value does that bring, whether of the Old Testament or New Testament, does it bring to the church? Uh, the confession tells us that it is the re revelation of God of himself and his will to the church. So what do these books uh, hold that are of great value to every believer, uh, the church of the living God. And so it is absolutely necessary for all of God's people to identify the books which uh, comprise what we call the canon of Scripture, or as our confession says, under the name of Holy Scripture. When we say Holy Scripture, what do we mean? Which books are involved? Which writings are involved with that? Uh, we can say that 1.1 of chapter 1 is regarding the inspiration of the Holy Scriptures. And 1.2 of chapter 1 is referring to the canonicity of the Holy Scriptures. Um, for those of you who are in our seminary, we spent a gr uh, great time in the subject of canonicity or canonization. Tonight's not those nights where I'm going to take you through the history of canonicity. But as simple as our confession speaks of, that's really talking about canonicity. And the word canon refers to a rule or measure. That's what canon means. It's not, a, again, a machine where we shoot cannonballs out of, okay? It is a measure. And it was used of the early church, the reformers, to, uh, again, um, during the Protestant movement, as we call it, against Roman Catholicism to really uh, defend that inspired Word of God to recognize which of the writings are really God-breathed. So 1.2 is a list of what we call the canon of Scripture. Very briefly, I must say to you that when we're talking about the canon of Scripture, there's two ways of understanding it. The, pro, the, the most common way evangelicals understand canonicity is by understanding it through the transmission of Scripture and how it was accepted by the church in history. For example, um, after the death of the last apostle John, how, it, how was it received by the early church fathers to the reformers to the modern day churches uh, t uh, presently? Um, and how, do we, uh, how did we get to this point where we can all agree that it's 66 books? So, to make it clear, the most um, common way of thinking of canon is how did the Protestants get to this point? Okay? But in our seminary, as I taught, when we think of canon, and I believe this is how our confession is, really tr is what it's really trying to teach us is not how did men, how do men come to receive the 66 books, but that very list that God himself said, that's my word. And so uh, in our seminary, we call this the ontological canon. And what that just means is the canon that God said was his. The ones that God said was his. And not the ones that men came up with and agreed and said, hey, we believe it's just this, that's it. Okay, so you have two ways of looking at that. Now, if you are confused of what I just said, you can uh, refer back or ask Brother Rodson to listen to that seminary class and lecture of canonicity. And I don't know, maybe it might help, maybe you might get more confused. <laughs> but uh, this is why we are here to help one another. There's a question? Yes, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ontological. ontological. So what that just means, um, again, briefly, uh, is it derived from God. It came from God as the source. He's the one who said, these are the books. And we know that these are the books because he's the one that breathed them. Um, now, you're going to have to read this and ask yourselves, well, how do we come to know that 66 books only and not more? Well, number one, and the ultimate reason we know, is because my sheep hear my voice, John 10, right? You'll read all these books, that study of canon, and they will give you external reasons, right? 
Well, which ones were recognized by the church? Well, which ones had more power and were more consistent with the writings? Um, which writings were written by the prophets and apostles? Those are all part of the criteria, but the main factor is the Holy Spirit witnesses to us and will only witness to His children that which is true. How did the New Testament saints live? They didn't have the 66 Protestant canon that we have today. But they knew God's word because the Holy Spirit witnessed to them. They knew the law of God because the Holy Spirit witnessed to them. And so over time, yes, God would use men to recognize these books. But ultimately, it is by the Holy Spirit's guidance to the word of God. And so we believe as we confess that it is found in these 66 books. That is the Holy Spirit's um, guidance for his corporate church to recognize as God's word and only that. No other additional book, no other writing of antiquity is called God-breathed authoritative scripture. It is just these 66 books. Amen? And so... 1.2 is talking about all Scripture. When we say Holy Scripture, it is those books that we refer to. So inspiration, when we say inspiration, it means, uh, it is the means, rather, by which the Bible received its authority. Remember the last question of our first Q&A? Um, number six, why is the Bible the only rule, infallible, certain, um, uh, for saving knowledge and faith and obedience? Well, because God breathed. So when we say inspiration, it's what gives the Bible its authority. When we say canonicity, it is how God's word is recognized. And that's what 1.2 is about. So again, what is God's word? What is all scripture? Which writings are God-breathed and have been given to us by God? And why is this important? For you, it may not be. And I feel like our, our modern-day um, churches have been spoiled with these books because it's in our hands, but we never really understood the struggle that our forefathers had or even the apostles and prophets had in their days when their writings were given to the churches. Um, well, as point three, we'll, we'll get eventually to point three of chapter one. Point three talks about what we call the Apocrypha. Um, you can also add other writings. Luke talks about this in Acts and, and Luke chapter one, where in his day there was a lot of writings, a lot of non-inspired writings. And so Luke says to Theophilus, I found it fitting I write you an account that is precise and in order. Because there's a lot of writings that are circulating and a lot of writings even before the birth of Jesus Christ that were already circulating, that were in the very law itself. And when I say law, the, the Old Testament Greek scriptures that the apostles and the Lord himself was using in the New Testament days. Why were there books that came in? Well, well, we'll leave that for the next time when we study that. But my point is, 1.3 is telling us there are books that are not of God and there are books that are. And so this is why it's important to recognize these 66 books, lest we as Christians who profess that the Bible is our, is our authority get fooled in believing other words, other writings. We must focus on that which only God breathed upon, all scriptures. And as we are told in Scripture, Matthew 7, 15, to beware of false prophets, we are also to beware of false writings and the work of false prophets, which is, this is part of that, deceiving many by their uh, foolish writings. And um, you'll learn that even in the Apocrypha, that the Apocrypha may not sound um, outright heretical in some books, it might sound historically correct and maybe orthodox in some points, but that does not make it God-breathed. Um, so we need to be focused on the only books that God has given us. And so though 1.2 is but a list to us, our Reformed forefathers, whether 
of the Westminster Confession or the London Baptist Confession uh, did excellent in marking out those 66 God-breathed books by the apostles and prophets who were led by the Holy Spirit. Remember what Peter says, that the Holy Spirit moved upon these men as no word was given by man's opinion or self-understanding, but all revelation is from the Holy Spirit himself. And so what do you have in your hands then? You say a book. No, God, when he gave you his revelation, did not give you a book. He gave you a library of books. That's how you understand what you have here in your hands. It is a library of books. It means you are given a wealth of riches to dive into and to dig in. And you will never outgrow the Bible. You'll never read it from cover to cover and say that you've known it all you will end up reading again from the very pages of Genesis or Matthew and you will realize that you've missed so much the first time you read it. It is getting sweeter and sweeter and more beautiful every time you get into God's Word. It's a library of, of authoritative truth. And so uh, that's why you need to know. Now, if I were to put a piece of paper and ask you which, or let me rephrase, what is all scripture? And I'd like you to name it for me. Would you be able to do that? Would you be able to? Now, some might be because of good memory. But by heart, would you be able to? Well, next week, you're going to have to. Because I want you to know your Bibles. I want you to memorize your Bibles. Because your Bibles are God's word given to you. And you need to know them. And so you're going to be tested on that. What are the 66 books of Scripture? If you're a professing believer, well, what's your authority? God's Word. Well, what's God's Word? I'm missing some. You need to know. You need to know. And, and again, this is for all of us to study and grow in the faith. Um, and, and next week's lesson, we'll realize that we're not just studying the structure of the Bible what it's inside the Bible itself. Today is more of the structure of the Bible. Next week we're going to go into the theme of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, all the way to Revelation, whenever we'll finish. And that we may end off um, being so thankful to God He has given us this word. So you need to know, what did God give you to meditate day in and day out? You need to know those books. And so uh, please write these down. I'm going to give you the structure of the Bible, which will really be the frame of the questions that I will ask you next week. So as we answer these questions, our confession tells us in 1.2, there are two testaments. It's divided in two major parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Bible is divided in two major parts, the Old and New Testament. And you might say, Pastor, I knew that. Well, good for you. <laughs> Old and New Testament. Well, what does the word testament mean? Well, the word testament should be, and it's much better translated, covenant. Uh, the, uh, the word covenant is a better word because the Greek word, the Hebrew word, means an agreement, a compact uh, that is made between two parties. Now, why testament? Why covenant? Well, it's used in the context of understanding God's promises in the days of Moses to his people. That covenant God made with his people during Moses' days in the Old Testament. And the promise that he will fulfill for his people. And then the New Testament comes from Jeremiah 31. 31. As, we, as, as I get you to turn with me there, that very word is seen in our Bibles in verse 31 of chapter 31 of Jeremiah. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, 
when I will make a new covenant. See? And this is a new covenant that if you keep reading, it's really speaking and pointing to Christ. The change of heart. A 3131 of Jeremiah. Yeah. And this is referring to Christ and the work of Christ. It's parallel to Ezekiel 36. Because verse 33, I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God. So when we speak of the New Testament, we're speaking of the Testament in the context of the new covenant that Christ brings. His perfect life, his perfect death, his perfect resurrection, his perfect righteousness. The promise of God fulfilled in him. And so that's where we get the label, Testament. It is the promise of God, you could say, in both um, parts. Now, with regard to the Old Testament, and are you all uh, ready to move on to this part? Or I hope I'm not going too quick. But the Old Testament contains 39 books. If you don't believe me, go count them at home. 39 books of the Old Testament. And these 39 books are written approximately over a span of a thousand years. One thousand years, roughly. And these 39 books are written by inspired human authors from Moses who writes Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and then we start getting into debates of who wrote the rest of the law. But from Moses first up to the time of Ezra and Nehemiah after the Babylonian captivity. And so you have several writers of the Old Testament books from Moses to Ezra and Nehemiah. And I think the best way, and this is really beneficial for you because I pray after you go home from, uh, after this teaching, you'd be able to look into your Bible and have greater confidence and know which books you can go to. And wow, that book talks about this. Well, we're going to divide them. You can divide them into four categories based on the writing style or the genre uh, that uh, is given to us in the Old Testament. And so four sections based on God's intention to how he used these men to write these books. Not every book is the same, especially in the Old Testament. When you read the Old Testament, you'll know there's a big difference between Jeremiah there's a big difference between Hosea and the book of Numbers, okay? Um, you'll know the difference because God has used them in their own unique ways. And so the first section is what we call the law, the books of the law. I know some of you might be wondering, well, pastor, what about the Hebrew way of dividing? That's not what we're talking about tonight. Again, that's something we talked about in our seminary lecture but for simplicity's sake, we're going to divide it to what our confession uh, points out, or at least to what Pastor John is pointing out that our confession may not have said. But the first is the law. And what is the law? The law is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They are called the law because this is where God gives forth insight of his heart where the moral law is given where it's set before the people regarding his holiness and what he desires his people to understand concerning himself their own sins and how they ought to live with one another the moral law the levitical law the civil law that god has given they are all insight to god's heart his holiness so the law, they are called because those books speak of them. The second section 
is what we call the poetical books or poetry. And the poetical books consist of, and I have to talk very slow because I know we're writing these books, Job, Psalms, the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Might be helpful to just write down the first three letters of each book. So Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. When you read them, it's a great expression. There's figure of speech. There's symbolism. There's allusions. There's metaphor. All of that is found. But poetry, not only to speak of the text, but to express the heart of love for God, these poetical books bring. And the third section is what we call the historical books. A large portion of the Old Testament is comprised of the history of God's people. And so, uh, what do we have? We have Joshua. We have Judges. We have Ruth. First and Second Samuel. First and Second Kings. First and Second Chronicles. Ezra. Nehemiah and Esther. Again, if you've missed anything, you can ask me at the end. I'll provide these things happily to you. And fourth is what we call the books of prophecy, the prophetical books. And we'll label it prophetical books. Some people will say major prophets, minor prophets, but we're going to label it prophets for the sake of simplicity. But in that, I'm going to still give you and provide you why there's major and minor prophets. But just label it prophets or the prophets, the books of prophecy. Now you'll notice in your Bibles, there are books written by prophets that are larger and there are books written by prophets that are smaller. And so when we say major and minor, it's not because Isaiah is better than Hosea and Jonah is less of a prophet than Jeremiah was. No, it's just because of the amount of writing that they have in each book. So with regards to the major prophets, we have who? The writings of Isaiah. The writing of Jeremiah. Another writing of Jeremiah, the book of Lamentations. The book of Ezekiel. The book of Daniel. Now with regards to the minor prophets, for some reason everyone forgets the minor prophets. But I pray that you don't. The minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Pray.
praise God for all these books. Amen. Oh, just one person. Amen. <laughs> praise God for these books. So that is the Old Testament structure. You can divide them into four sections. I think it will help you in your study of God's Word to understand from what perspective the writer is bringing forth God's Word. And if you have not known how God ordered the Old Testament, well, that's, uh, I hope this is of help to you. Now we move on to the New Testament. And the New Testament contains 27 books. 27 books. And these books are written in one century. One century. Not a thousand years, but one century. That is how precise and close God's word is especially in the gospels are the revelation of Christ and so these books are written by specific apostles not all apostles but specific ones uh, for example Matthew uh, another one is John Peter right the apostle Paul who makes up the majority of the New Testament writings um, and some of the companions of the apostles, for example, Luke, John Mark, right? Jude, arguably, uh, some say he's an apostle. <coughs> we, most like me, do not consider him one, but a companion, uh, the half-brother of the Lord. Um, and so, these are... Uh, several of those authors of the New Testament, if not all of them. But you can also divide the New Testament into four sections. This is more familiar to us. The first one is the Gospels, right? Those books which contain the revelation of Jesus Christ in the world, manifest in the flesh, His life, His ministry, His perfect death and resurrection, The whole statement of Hebrews 1, 1 to 2 is found in the four Gospels, where in the latter days He has revealed Himself through His Son. And the second section would be the book of history, and that is the Acts of the Apostles. The Acts of the Apostles. The third is the Epistles. Again, you might speak to different teachers and read different books. And when it comes to the epistles, you might have divisions of the Pauline epistles or the pastoral epistles or the, um, yeah, the Johannine epistles. For simplicity's, simplicity's sake, we're going to just name them the epistles. That is to mean the letters, the letters. And so what are the epistles? Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, first and second Peter, first to third John, and Jude. If you don't remember, it's from Romans to Jude. All of that is the epistles. Pastor, you could have said that. No, you need to know. You need to hear. From Romans to Jude, those are the epistles. And lastly, the book of prophecy or better known, the book of Apocalypse. The book of Revelation. It is the book of Apocalypse because it speaks of the final uh, point of God's promise. It speaks of the end. 
It speaks of the very peak of God's plan of redemption, revelation. Those are the four divisions of the New Testament and the Old Testament. One of the things you'll notice is this, the very straightforwardness of our confession. It says that here it is, as, as we read it carefully, under the name of Holy Scripture or the Word of God written are now contained all the books of the Old and New Testaments and it starts labeling them down. It is assuming and greatly implying to us that there is no contradiction between the two Testaments. There's great harmony between the two Testaments. Yes, it is a library of many books, but they are books that all are united. They are united. And what are they united on? The revelation of God in the person of Jesus Christ. Well, you might say, well, pastor, the New Testament is the only place that reveals Christ. Nope. Every book of that Bible from the beginning refers to God's heart, God's plan, God's desire for His people to know Christ. And so both Testaments are united on many things doctrinally, on many things um, that God has taught His people but certainly on the person of Jesus Christ. Turn with me to Luke 24, 44. And I would like to end tonight with this encouragement, Luke 24, 44. I was tempted to go on and tell you the themes of the Bible tonight, but that's, there's too much to write and too much to absorb. And... Um, Pastor loves you enough to not abuse you. <laughs> Luke 24, 44. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. That everything written about me, who's me? Jesus. Everything written about me in the, the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Now it's important when you think of the Jewish canon, the Jews viewed the Old Testament differently than how I just divided it to you. To them, it is either a twofold or threefold division. And Jesus gives us an example of a threefold division the law, the prophets, the Psalms. Okay? So, what is Jesus saying in verse 44? Everything in the Old Testament is about me. That's what he's saying. All of the books from Genesis to Malachi point to me. Well, Pastor, that's only talking about the Old Testament. Well, what do you think the New Testament is about? It's about Jesus. Right? And so this is where you see the continuity, the unity between both Testaments. It is not one God for the Old and another God for the New. It is the same God revealing the same Christ to His very people. The theme of Scripture is Christ. And as we close tonight, I would like you to write these things um, with Christ's relation with the divisions that we've just mentioned, that we've come to recognize tonight. Now, with regards to the Old Testament, here are the relations of Christ to the very divisions that we made in the Old Testament. The law is the foundation for Christ. The law is the foundation for Christ. As I said to you earlier, it brings forth insight to the very heart of God, to His people, of what they ought to know about the Holy God. 
It is the foundation for Christ. Now, the books of history and its relation to Christ... It is preparation for Christ. The other is foundation for Christ. The historical, historical books are the preparation for Christ. As you read the books of history, what do you see? Lines of kings, lines of faithful, lines of wicked. But God has been faithful to preserve his people, through, even through captivity, to preserve them, to bring forth Christ. It's to prepare Christ. The books of poetry and its relation to Christ. Aspiration for Christ. Aspiration for Christ. Longings for the Savior. Longings for the Maker. Longings for Christ. As you read in the Psalms. As you see in the cries of the Proverbs. The Song of Solomon, though speaking in relation with his wife, is really a great parallel to one's relation, their love for God, aspiration for Christ. The Proverbs speak of a youthful love, not leaving your youthful love. The books of prophecy and its relation to Christ. Well, prophecy in its relation to Christ, its expectation of Christ. These books of prophecy cry aloud that Christ is coming. Just read the last book, the book of Malachi, and how it greatly encourages God's people that the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in His wings. Isaiah speaks of this greatly. The light will come. You, great, you read of the prophets and they are expecting the Christ. When we get to the New Testament and the relation of Christ to the New Testament divisions that we made and recognized tonight, the Gospels, well, what was the Old Testament? The books of prophecy is what? The expectation for Christ. So then the Gospels is the manifestation of Christ. Christ in the flesh. Emmanuel, God with us. The manifestation of Christ. The book of Acts or the book of history the propagation of Christ the spreading of the gospel <coughs> the salvation of those both Jews and Gentiles the erection of churches the propagation of Christ proclaimed to the world The epistles, the application of Christ. What do you read to the churches? How the people of God ought to live in light of their salvation. You have been saved, therefore you must live as those who have been saved. If indeed you have been risen with Christ, Paul says. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How can we who have been buried with Christ live any longer therein? If you've been saved, this is the way we ought to live. If you love me, keep my... Com oh, sorry, that's not, that's not the epistles. I'm just quoting something that's... There you go, you caught me. First John 2. Walk in him. Walk as he walked. And the last book, the book of Revelation. The consummation in Christ. Consummation in Christ.
consummation, the day where we will finally be with Him intimately, where we will be with Him finally. We will walk with Him. As Revelation says, He will be our God and we will be His people and He will be the light for His people. There's no need of the sun any longer. He will be the light to His people. Together with Him forever. All of the books of the Bible speak of Christ. And Luke 24, 44 is correct. It spoke of me, Jesus says. It spoke of me. And so what is that, what is that pointing to you tonight? Is that if you are to know more of Christ, if you are to know more of salvation, then you must recognize the writings that speak of Him. Amen? And so I pray that you go home tonight and you ask yourselves, why do I read the Bible? Because it speaks of Christ. It speaks of my Maker, my Creator, my love and my Savior. And each book, no matter its genre and the way it was written, I love because it speaks of my Lord. It points back to Him. And yes, it may speak of accounts of the past, but it always points me back to Him, His beauty, His glory. They are of great encouragement to us. Again, remember 1.1, please. All of Scripture is the only infallible rule, saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. And all of Scripture, what is that? It's the 66 books. I'll tell you, if you just go with 1.1, you're lost. Why? Because, yeah, you know God's Word is the only thing you need. But what is God's Word? Well, that's what we're learning tonight. You need to know what is God's Word. And so tonight we learn of the structure of the Bible, and I pray that you are not just memorizing these things. That's the last thing. I know, I know we love memorizing and studies like this. Maybe not love memorizing, but... <laughs> But we love days like this where our memory is challenged. But I pray that it's not just memory. But truly to come under the power of these inspired writings. And as I said, next week we'll continue by looking at each book and its theme generally and briefly. Because um, we're not going to take all the time in learning entire books. But the theme of each book to help you understand them as you approach them. But as you go tonight, consider the greatness of the Bible, the greatness of the library of books that God has given you. The depth, the height, the width of God's revelation given to you. It's one thing to say it's given to the church, yes, but to you, for you. And it's a shame when it's just on the shelf and it's not being opened. This word is for you. And until you see it that way, it would be of no value to you. That word is for you. It's for you to dig in. And as I said, you'll never outgrow it. It, it gets sweeter and gets deeper and wider as the years go on. Spurgeon said, The flowers of God's garden bloom not only double, but sevenfold. They are continually pouring forth fresh fragrance. Amen? So love God, love His Word, and go home. Know your Bibles. Next week, questions will be presented. And um, I pray that this will lead you to a week of study, but not just memorizing the sections and divisions. But wow, Christ is seen in all of these books. So it won't be a struggle for you because you love God's law. Yes? yes. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you, O Lord that even in this way you have given and shown us, Lord, that you've loved us enough to give us not just one book, but a library of books where your love is shown in all of them, where Christ is revealed in all of them, <coughs> written so precisely, so sufficiently for us to grow in the life of faith that we have in you. Oh, gracious God, thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, that when we read the table of contents, that alone causes us to weep and ponder upon your faithfulness to give us so many books of your beauty. Oh God, forgive us for our lack of attention to your word. And Lord, may we all cultivate hearts that love your law like the psalmist, to delight in your law, 
and to see your words as the lamp and the light unto our feet and our paths. This night, with everything we've learned, we pray that it becomes, uh, it would generate to our humility and our increase of love for Christ. I pray that you provide all the wisdom and all the things necessary in our life as believers as we walk this world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.